hello, my name is Stephanie Hillis and I am the Arts and Humanities Librarian at Wirtz Art and Architecture Library at Miami University in Ohio. Um, and on Zoom is one of my liaison faculty, Rob Robbins, Professor of Art. So today we will be presenting Serendipitous Discovery, the library as place for creative inspiration. Um, I will begin the presentation with a brief discussion of art students' preferred information-seeking strategy, namely browsing. And then I will detail a lesson plan from the librarian perspective that Rob and I used in Art UNV 101, which is a first year experience course, and advanced drawing. Um, in the lesson, students engage in serendipitous browsing by creating book spine poetry, a found poetry technique where books are arranged so that their titles create a poem. After that, Rob will give his perspectives as an art professor, detailing the outcomes of the lesson and how it benefited his students. So let's begin with the role of serendipity in arts research. So um, artists and art students have a marked preference for browsing the stacks as an information seeking strategy for inspiration and serendipitous discovery. This behavior was first noted by Derek Tony in his article, A Philosophy for Falmouth in 1977, and runs steadily throughout the literature to this day. Um, much of the literature also equates browsing with the joys of serendipity. Uh, for example, one participant in Tammy Echavaria Robinson's 2014 study states, it's like a spark and certain things change when you think about it further. So given this knowledge, I began to ask myself, how can I incorporate artist preference for browsing as an information seeking strategy into the library classroom, both as a way to engage art students and to demonstrate the library and its resources can function as a place for creative inspiration and serendipitous encounters. I felt this question was of particular importance after COVID closures, uh, when students had lost the ability to use the physical library and had to depend solely on online resources. So uh, like any good librarian, I began to research and I was looking for lesson plan examples that I could potentially tailor to art students. Um, however, I found that ideas for how I could accomplish this were few and far between. Um, the majority of the instruction literature focuses on teaching searching, not browsing. And I suspect that this gap is because searching is more easily broken down into a teachable process, um, while successful browsing is harder to explain because it does depend on things like serendipity. So a similar phenomenon, although to a lesser extent, is also found in information seeking models. Little mention of browsing or information encountering, as you sometimes hear it referred to in the literature, um, exists until uh, Sandra Alderez's 1999 article, Information Encountering, it's more than bumping into information. And of course, that's like published 22 years after Tony had made the observation that artists really prefer browsing as a search strategy. So um, since then, and since that article, um, information encountering or browsing is found more often in both information seeking models and library literature as a whole, yet searching still receives more attention. So in addition to my research into artists preferred information seeking strategies, there were some other serendipitous circumstances that gave rise to this lesson plan. Um, first, at the Arliss UK and Ireland conference in Glasgow in 2019, I had the pleasure of attending a workshop hosted by Viv Eves and Adam Ramjakis called Creative Library Research, Experiencing Theory, held at the Glasgow School of Art Library. Uh, during this workshop, mm -hmm. participants became students and we browsed the art books based on a self-chosen theme, then swapped those books with another, or with another participant and discuss how our new book related to our original theme. Uh, this workshop, particularly that swapping of books and having to come up with this relationship between our new book and our previous theme, relied heavily on chance. 
So as I started to think more and more about how chance plays a role in serendipitous browsing, I couldn't think, help but think about how chance had been explored as an artistic practice by um, various artists like Gerhard Richter and movements like Dada. And I began wondering if I could somehow introduce serendipity through artistic practice. Uh, finally, Miami University happened to be doing a major weed on its library collections, and um, the librarians had started this kind of group chat where we began sharing like hum humorous and interesting titles that we had found on these shelves. And this reminded me of the artist Nina Kachadorian and the bookspine poetry of her Sorted Books project. I had previously been the librarian and archivist at the Akron Art Museum, and before my employment there, Kachadorian had chosen the library as one of her locations for her bookspine poetry. So um, with all of these things, my ideas really began gelling into something cohesive. So um, before I discuss the lesson plan, let's take a closer look at Nina Kachadorian's Sorted Books project. So um, since 1993, Kachadorian has been going into libraries and creating bookspine poems by, in her words, sorting through a collection of books, pulling particular titles, and eventually grouping the books into clusters so that their titles can be read in sequence. And as you can see, these poems are then photographed. The examples on the slide here are taken from her aforementioned work with the library collections at the Akron Art Museum. So for my lesson plan, I would have students mimic Kachadorian's process. After introducing them to the Sorted Books project in a short PowerPoint, students would be sent into the stacks to browse through and through the principles of serendipity and chance, write book spine poems based on the titles that they found. And then afterwards, students' poems would be exhibited in the library's display area. So on this slide, you see um, my outline for a 55-minute lesson plan. First, I explain the activity and introduce Nina Kachadorian. Then students go into the stacks and create their own bookspine poems. After making their poems, students set them up for display. And then finally, students get a chance to walk around and read and discuss their classmates' poems. Uh, my learning objectives are also on this slide. At the end of the lesson, Students will engage in the library as a place for artistic inspiration and creative exploration, experience browsing the stacks for serendipitous discovery, and create their own art object in the form of a bookspine poem. So this is a lesson plan that we used in the first iteration um, in Art UNV 101. The second and third iterations for advanced drawing were longer in format, and I will discuss that in more detail in the following slides. Um, here you see some pictures of students writing their books fine poems in the stacks. So um, now I will discuss the various iterations of the lesson and how they evolved over time. So the first iteration um, was implemented in Art UNV 101, which is a first year experience course for students enrolled in the School of Art. And I chose this class for a couple of reasons. Um, first, because Rob was the instructor. Uh, he and I had worked together before, and I knew that he was always on board with experimentation and my kind of like crazy ideas that I have. Um, <laughs> second, from previous conversations with Rob, I knew that browsing the library for inspiration had been a key part of his practice um, when he was in school. So um, the lesson plan, it was a success. Students were really engaged and clearly enjoying their time. Um, in fact, many wrote like multiple poems, um, which I thought was really great. Um, in fact, the lesson was actually successful in ways that I didn't intend. Uh, library patrons interpreted the Bookspine Poetry exhibition as interactive and began creating new poems with the books that were on display. Um, thus, they too had the chance to experience serendipity and the library as a place for creative exploration. Given the success of the first iteration, Rob and I decided to expand the lesson in an advanced drawing class the following semester. After students created their book spine poems, they chose either their poem or one of their other classmates and sketched a response to it in class, as you see on the slide here. Uh, they also had the opportunity to complete a finished drawing based on their chosen poem for extra credit. 
Uh, the papers that you see on top of the poems here are actually permission forms. Uh, the library used photos of the poems on its social media for National Poetry Month in April. So um, for the third iteration, um, that was the following year, the lesson was expanded even further. Uh, this time, students completed a finished drawing based on their poem or another student's poem, and this was their first graded drawing for the class. So um, once drawings were complete, oop, there we go. Once drawings were complete, the class critique was held in the library, and I also participated. Um, and then drawings were displayed, as you can see here, alongside the bookspine poems in the library's display area for the remainder of the semester, and again, was used on the library social media for National Poetry Month. Uh, labels were also created this time, listing student name and indicating which poem had inspired the drawing. Uh, labels were intended to discourage viewers from interacting with the exhibit and making new poems. Um, I had really enjoyed that part of like previous iterations, but um, obviously letting patrons rearrange the poems would have compl complicated the continuity uh, we wanted to create between the poems and the drawings. Um, as it turned out, these labels were not enough. And after a few weeks, I had to add additional signage asking patrons not to move the books. Um, and with that, I'll go ahead and hand it over to Rob for outcomes. Hi, everybody. I hope you can hear me out there. Um, so great. Stephanie, you can move to the next slide. <clears throat> um, all right. So just um, a, a word of warning. I'm having to synchronize three screens right now. So bear with me. Um, okay, so a little um, background and rationale. Uh, but before that, I just want to say that this project and um, the outcomes that were a part of it could never have happened without um, Stephanie's uh, a vision for this project and her, her knowledge and her willingness to let my students go in and make a complete mess of the library. Um, and I think part of the fun of this project for the students and what caused this incredible engagement was the fact that they could go in with abandon and do whatever they wanted in the library. So <clears throat> uh, moving on, conventionally, um, formal art programs like the one we have at Miami University and really all those I've been um, engaged with over my career have uh, one little complication and it is that <clears throat> learning to make art is a difficult and complicated challenge with many sort of components. And so we break a, a, the curriculum down into um, component elements that uh, will not, in the beginning, let students understand the entirety of what making a, in our work is. And so conventionally, programs will start with sort of procedural, technical, and perceptual sort of activities, building sets of skills. Um, in order to streamline and clarify, programs will not look very hard, very often, at um, issues of content or expression or voice in the first couple of years. Um, it's there, and we'll talk about it, but it's not the priority. Um, and so uh, <clears throat> that means that, um, you know, certain things come out of the work and certain things don't. So, uh, Stephanie, if we can move to the next slide. So this project um, addressed the that particular challenge and a number of others relative to it. Um, so um, as I already mentioned, students have gone through a conventional foundation art program that focuses on technical, formal, and perceptual skills. Um, and so they'll often have difficulty transitioning, maybe in, in our case, from the second year to the third year, to being asked to develop work that is really about their vision, their voice, their beliefs. Um, you know, this is a, a, a really, it's a, it's a difficult and challenging sort of transition for them. And this project was sort of designed to specifically address that. Um, students will often develop resistance to the expression of content. They build a set of values in their first and second year that is about the technical proficiency, about the perceptual, about the, the visual acumen, about compositional and formal um, qualities. So then when you start to say, that's not what we're first going to discuss, they start to say things like, um, I'm not looking for any deep meaning in my work. Uh, you know, um, you know, there's a, a little bit of resistance. So um, 
<clears throat> so those are the sorts of things that we were trying to alleviate or sort of overcome in this particular project. Um, okay, next slide, please, Stephanie. And let me coordinate here. So you can see <clears throat> um, these are some sort of very typical student outcomes from um, an early drawing or an early creative arts uh, course. It's very formal, it's very didactic. Um, we are trying to address very specific sort of perceptual skills and acumen. And um, so here we have three diversely different students whom all have produced works for a particular project that look very, very similar to one another. Um, they're fine drawings, but there's no unique voice. Um, there's no expressive content within these works. Um, if we could have the next slide, please, Stephanie. So here's another one. Um, this was the same class, a different project. And we have three more students who have produced drawings, and they each have their unique attributes, right? They're, they're slightly different in terms of composition, but compositional strategies are similar. They're slightly different in terms of, um, you know, placement of subject, but the subject is similar. And, uh, you know, these students would be building a set of values as they're sort of creating these drawings. Okay, next image, please, Stephanie. Okay, so... Here are a few of the benefits of um, using the poem first when students arrived in my 300 level um, drawing class. Now, <clears throat> as context, the um, 300 drawing, 300 level drawing class really comes just two drawing classes after the drawings you just saw. So students will have a figurative drawing class um, and uh, one other sort of elective drawing class, neither of which are going to be addressing issues of content. So, um, you know, again, the complication is that students would become reluctant to express their own voice, and we wanted a, an opportunity to get them over that. So by using the poem first, students were not self-conscious about their content when creating poems. Um, and I think there are a few reasons for this. This approach seemed to separate content and expression from subject and representation. Um, the book titles provoked creative problem solving and inspired really unexpected creative trajectories. And I think that was one of the coolest things about this project is um, students weren't thinking drawing or subject or self-expression. They were just in the stacks sort of going, what interesting combinations can I make? And can I feel some, can I feel something out that seems to be sort of um, meaningful and provocative? Um, so the array of options and the expediency of the creation of the poems allowed students to explore subjects and content that they would typically be very apprehensive to explore if I said to them, okay, you're going to spend 10 hours on a drawing. Okay? And you go, you have this huge investment. And they go, I better say something really important. And this project sort of completely avoided that. Um, students did not consider themselves poets or writers in my class. This is a class four majors. Um, that are thinking of studying design or art ed or studio art. Um, and so the creation of the poem with book titles did not carry this burden of their artistic reputation and identity as they were creating these poems. They could just freely explore and create. Um, so they were, while exploring the stacks and building these poems, really creative without any hesitation. They would just go in and say, what's this, what's this, what's this? Um, and they sought really unexpected outcomes. They, you could see them sort of broadening their vision of what they could talk about. Um, they could also collaborate. So it was really interesting to see that students would be talking to one another in the stacks. They would be exploring. They would also sort of say, oh, well, you know, Maggie's working on this particular poem over here. And I just found a book that would be really cool as part of that poem. And so they'd be swapping books and sort of searching for one another. Um, and by the very nature of the project, students created works that had this sort of foundation of influence, which I thought was super exciting. Um, you know, they're finding these poems, and then they're thinking about the authors. They're reading the books. They're, um, you know, sort of noticing where they are within the section of the library. And so uh, a sort of a history sort of develops, um, an understanding of sort of the evolution of their artwork um, shows up as part of this project. Okay, let's go to the next slide. 
Okay, so some of the curious aspects of this approach. Um, when we started the project uh, this previous semester, we um, were not, we did not tell the students prior to the project that they were going to use these poems as inspiration for a drawing. Uh, we, we really, or at least I did, you know, I don't know what Stephanie was thinking on the other end, but I, um, I just said, you know, you're going to need to use the library and build resource and have um, a catalog of your influences for your work for this class. And so I need to make sure you are really familiar with our stacks. Um, and so we're going to go and we're going to meet the art librarian. We're going to explore the stacks and we're going to do a small project. Um, they did not know that this was going to lead to uh, content for their first drawing. Students were allowed to use any of the poems created on display. So um, there were you know, 18 students in the class, something around that number. Uh, students made multiple poems and students could use any of the poems they wanted. They did not have to use a poem they created. Um, students were allowed to use the poem as literally or as loosely as they wanted in their drawing once we told them they were going to be making a drawing inspired by one of these poems. So some students really sort of went full bore into using the poem as the driver for a drawing, um, as the driver for creative and expressive content. And some really sort of looked at the poem and said, I think I can kind of use this poem to sort of shape the thing I already kind of want to talk about. And it gave them confidence to talk about the thing they were already thinking about. Um, <clears throat> it's also interesting that this project of creating the poem was the very first creative activity they were asked to do in the course. They hadn't made any sketches, any drawings. Um, all we'd done up to this point is review the syllabus for the class and um, say, next class, we're going to meet in the library. Uh, next slide, please, Stephanie. <clears throat> so here's some of the really interesting and surprising outcomes. Uh, most students chose to use a poem that was not one of their own poems, but was um, created by somebody else. And so that tells me right away that they were looking through all these poems and trying to find something that sort of resonated with them, and they also thought would be powerful for a drawing. Um, they were thinking of content and what they could say through these, these drawings inspired by the poems. Um, no student voiced any complaint at all about having to use a poem as inspiration. They therefore were not um, seeing any complaints about, you know, being asked to consider content first or the expressive component of the drawing. Um, the poems touched on a, an array of different traditional artistic criteria, which I thought was pretty interesting. Um, there were poems that were clearly very expressive in nature. There were ones that were kind of avant-garde and sort of challenging form. There were very formal poems that were just looking at sort of rhythm of language or structure. There were instrumental poems that were really looking at society and, um, and community and how we could change the world or what the world was. And then there were very realistic poems that were like, this is the way it is. This is our experience. Um, this acted as a bit of a framework for our first discussion of drawings along with sort of the nature of the poem. But that range of criteria held within the poems was much broader than what we would typically see if I just said, make some drawings and let's see what we get. The project naturally led to a content first approach for the drawing. So um, typically at this stage when students are transitioning from a, a didactic sort of formal education, to um, one that focuses on content and expression, uh, they're the first sort of saying, well, what can I, what, I'm gonna use my process first. I've got my strengths in drawing or painting, and then can I find some content that fits into that? And by doing it this way, they really said, oh, what do I wanna do something about? And then how can I sort of acclimate my skills and my capacities to that sort of, um, that, that, that content? So that meant there were more iterative, um, uh, you know, steps gone through in developing the work. There were more technical studies. Um, there was a much broader range of sort of consideration. Students naturally used the skills they developed in their foundation courses. And I thought this was interesting. They were able to very easily take those things they developed in their first couple of years and apply them to this new thing they wanted to do. So that wasn't lost and it wasn't subservient. It was really, it became a, an expressive tool for them, their, um, their foundation experience. And then the critique of the drawings naturally used the poem as a framework. So the critique was very content first. It was, what is this student trying to say? 
instead of what's right or wrong with the drawing in a formal um uh, and from a formal lens and uh, that's seldom seen so quickly you know you typically have to work students to this sort of experience okay next slide stephanie and i'm getting close and so real quickly this is i'm not going to read through this I'll, I'll save you the the pain of that but um this is just the first couple paragraphs of the um of the uh the course description in the syllabus let's go to the next slide stephanie um, and so just a couple lines from that, this course explores, examines, and considers drawings as an expressive medium. So um, the project allowed students to naturally consider the content and the expression, um, the priority over the formal, technical, perceptual components of the drawing. And I thought that was amazing and something that was one of the primary focuses of this class for me. Um, the course description also said, in this class, you will be creating drawings with the purpose of developing a cohesive body of work that explores and develops a personal voice and expression. And in this case, the poems allowed each student to choose content that they were excited about exploring. Um, so giving them sort of that menu of possibilities um, meant that they could go through and say, do I want to draw about that? Do I want to draw about that? Very often, students would make three or four studies from three or four different poems and then go, this is the one I want to do. All right, so let's look at some examples. Next slide, Stephanie. Okay, so um, right here we have the poem. This was Claire Farrow, and Claire really had no idea what she wanted to draw about when she came into the class. Her poem, Controversies, Dialogue, Buildings Must Die, Ruins of Ancient Rome, Stillness and Light. And you can see here, she was doing these drawings where she was really thinking about sort of human influence on landscape then, about how we've, um, built things and then abandoned things. And that was, I thought that was pretty powerful content um, considering, you know, um, the previous semester she was making drawings like we saw in the previous slides. Let's go to the next slide. Okay. <clears throat> this is Megan Sekulich. Megan's poem was super short. Megan's one of the few students that made her poem and then drew from her poem. And her simply says, Art as existence, make it fabulous. Megan um, was a studio art major. She's graduated now and a, um, a fashion major. And she was looking for an opportunity to fuse fashion and her studio um, considerations about self and body image. And so she ended up making these big drawings of pinup dolls, big centric considering what our foundation program is. Let's look at the next slide, Stephanie. Here we have Olivia. Olivia's poem um, was um, You Are Here, Walk the Line with Space in Mind. And uh, this caused Olivia to start thinking about sort of tensions in space. And um, if you can see it, she's made these drawings where, um, you know, they're almost Baroque in nature. Tenuous things could potentially happen. A glass sort of sitting on the edge of a counter waiting to be knocked or somebody fixing an electrical a light bulb while somebody else is about to turn the switch on. Um, <clears throat> All right, let's look at the next image. Um, and so this is the last of the student examples I'll show. This is Zoe Newbig. And um, <clears throat> Zoe already had the inclination to be somewhat eccentric about her work. But um, this poem, The Comfortable House, Pictures of Innocence, The Girl with the Gallery, Writing on the Wall, this poem really allowed her to take all those things she was looking for and combine them into a work that didn't have any obligation to her previous um, sort of tendencies to make these long rendered drawings. So um, next image, please, Stephanie. Just sort of, again, to sort of recap is a side-by-side -side comparison. This is what students were doing, you know, just sometimes a semester or two semesters before this class. And this is the same cohort of students moving through. Next slide, please, Stephanie. And then this is sort of the array of drawings that those students were making um, in the first three weeks of this class. So the transition was fast. It was um, accepted. It was powerful. Um, and all the students were really instead of being resistant to building content, we're excited about bringing in their own voice. Okay, next slide, Stephanie. That, that's my part. I'm going to give it back to you, Stephanie. 
Awesome, thank you. So um, I just have like one and a half more minutes. I've timed myself. So um, moving forward, Rob and I expect to continue this project in future semesters, but we've also been thinking about ways that we can create opportunities for students to have these kind of serendipitous chance encounters in the stacks. Uh, the first idea is to create instructions that would ask students to go into the stacks and um, engage with books through chance an idea inspired by Fluxus artist Yoko Ono's instructions in her 1963 book, Grapefruit. Um, so for example, one instruction might be to go into the stacks and stand in the center aisle, turn around three times, go to the shelf you are facing and choose the 12th book on the left side. Look at the images and think about how what you see could inform your current work. Uh, the second idea is to use a large paper fortune teller. Um, and by counting and moving the fortune teller a given number of times, patrons would be instructed to perform a particular action. So um, for example, go to the shelf marked NA737 through NA1053 and find a book that interests you. Flip through it. Decide if you'd like to check it out. And um, bibliography. And Thank you. Um, that's all we have for you today. Um, yeah.